what this tells us in a way is that all the mineral resources tend to be bad for economic growth, because this is what we find. Uh, they're not bad for growth because of any kind of direct effect they're bad for growth because they hit all these other intermediate transmission channels. They're bad for growth because of increased corruption, reduced investment, decreased trade openness, uh, reduced unfavorable terms of trade, and reduced uh, schooling. Of course, if you have a look at the paper, there are many more regressions there with the evidence also about the relationship between these variables between those resources. Um, now, some critique and some things to keep in mind, and uh, this is something that can also be very confusing for those who work in this data too. Some people use the terms resource abundance and resource dependence interchangeably, as if these two terms are exactly the same thing. But actually, this is not true, and there is uh, <coughs> Seminal paper. There is a very famous paper in 2008 um, in the Journal of Environmental Economics and Management by David von Strunschweiler, Christopher Schweiler, and Erwin Kulte. I know them both very well, that's why I remember the names. So they're very difficult names. Paper in 2008. So they're the first ones who made the distinction between resource abundance and resource dependence. At least uh, in the empirical econometrics literature. So what they say, what they said in the paper is that when you talk about resource dependence, it can be all dependent, mineral dependence, it doesn't matter. What you do then is that you want to express the value of natural resources, let's say the value of minerals, in terms of another economic activity. Typically, think of GDP, so you can think of the value of mineral rents as a share of GDP, or it can be as a percentage of the value of total exports, right? But in the denominator, you need to have the value of another economic activity. This is the measure of resource dependence. When you talk about resource abundance, then you express the value of mineral resources in terms of the variable that uh, in terms of a non-economic variable, uh, a non-economic variable that is also less likely to be influenced, to be endogenous and influenced by uh, mineral resources. Because of course you can imagine that GDP right, might not be exogenous to the value of minerals. So typically you divide the value of mineral resources by the population, so you express it in per capita terms, or uh, let's say uh, per square kilometer, per surface. The typical value that you have is divide the value of mineral resources in per capita terms. Value of natural resources divided by the population. And when growth uh, empirical papers distinguish between these two different types of um, natural resource measures, what they uh, normally find is that the resource curse holds when, you me when we use measures of resource dependence. Here we have evidence of resource, the resources. When we use minerals divided by GDP or minerals divided by exports. But when you use the value of minerals divided by population, then the resource curse disappears. Then we find hardly any evidence of a negative correlation between mineral resources expressed again per capita terms and long term growth. Any thoughts why this might be the case? So what happens in terms of the first measure, again, the measure of mineral dependence, that tells you how important the extractive industry, the primary sector, right, the oil rents, are uh, in relation to other economic activities, in relation to the rest of the economy. And some of you might say, this is actually a really what matters in terms of the resources. How dominant is your extractive sector, is the oil sector, with respect to the other economic activities that take place? Uh, now, when we express the value in a sense of population, often we don't find the resource curves. Because although the ratio of mineral rents uh, 
per person might be high, the economy, for example, might be diversified, I think might be a diversified economy uh, to a large extent. So the fact that you only have a lot of mineral resources, this, uh, for example, might not create a lot of transit, I might not really use the same trade and so on. And the typical example of the country to think about is the distinction is probably in Norway. Right? Um, so all of you probably know that Norway is a very oil-rich country. It has a vast deposit of uh, oil. Now, in terms of um, resource abundance, um, Norway scores very high. It has a very small population, close to 5 million. A lot of oil. Also, if you divide oil by population size, the measure of oil abundance uh, tends, to be, uh, tends to get a very high level of the Norwegian uh, uh, status. But when you express the value of oil as the share of GDP in Norway, this, this doesn't tend to be very high. So, although Norway is very oil abundant, it's not very oil dependent, right? Because the Norwegian economy is well diversified. Although Norway has a lot of oil, it also has an extensive service sector, a manufacturing sector, a banking sector, and so on. So although there is a lot of uh, oil, it doesn't need to be disruptive in terms of other uh, economic activity. Um, there is also a distinction in the literature about what we call point versus the human resources. And point resources basically think about it as the extractive sector in oil or the mineral. These are the resources that are geographically concentrated. So when you run a regression and you have point resources, either that oil or mineral, then you find a strong negative correlation between these point resources and economic growth. When you want to talk about diffuse resources, these are the uh, natural resources that are more widely uh, spread benefit larger segments of the population. Right? The resources such as uh, agriculture, for example, land, um, timber, fisheries, of course it depends on the countries. Some countries, the timber sector is also very uh, much uh, concentrated. But when you have this type of diffuse resources that benefit larger segments of the population, you also find uh, weaker evidence for resources. So typically the resource pairs holds for the uh, uh, for the mineral resources for the so-called point. Something that I should mention earlier on, when I talk about the Dutch disease. So the story that I said about the Dutch disease, of course, I concentrated my attention to the, uh, to the mining sector, because my lecture today is uh, a lot about natural resources and economic growth. But the Dutch disease effect, of course, can be triggered, can be initiated by um, any uh, other income shock. Right? It can be an income shock that comes as a result of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mineral uh, discoveries, like the sudden increase in uh, the price of oil. But it can also be a Dutch disease effect that starts um, as an income shock, for instance, from A, there are other papers that have looked at Dutch disease in countries that all of a sudden start to see mineral you know, A. So imagine you have a kind of a lot of sudden stabilizers, 